Leonardo was born into an impoverished family in Milan, Italy. Sometime after his birth, his mother was widowed, left as a poor single mother to raise five children on her own. You can imagine the despair. The despair, in fact, was so deep that Leonardo's mother actually took him at the age of seven to an orphanage and left him there. I can't begin to bring into my mind or my heart the feelings that must have surged in that little boy's life at age seven to be in an orphanage. They didn't cut ties. His family was still there. They just couldn't afford to care for him. So there he was for the years to come until at age 14, he went to work to try to help support his family. He worked in an industrial factory, worked hard, worked so hard, in fact, that at one point in time he had an accident that cost him one of his fingers. But little Leonardo was determined, this is not going to be the end of my story, not working like this, not having to eat hand to mouth, live hand to mouth. And so he began to plan and began to dream. At the age of 19, he started going to school to study as an industrial engineer. He went to school at night, worked in the daytime. It was a difficult life. But he had plans. He had dreams. It wasn't too long later that he actually went to work for an eyeglass manufacturing company and became fascinated with eyeglass frames. Over the years, with a great deal of grit and determination, stick to and dreaming, Leonardo was able to start his own company, a company which over the years finally began to make its own brand of eyeglassware, of frames. The company grew. It became a leader, not only a leader there in his local area, not only in Venice where he had been located, but it ultimately became the global leader in eyeglass frames. The name of the company, Luxottica. Leonardo's last name, Leonardo Del Vecchio. From the company's website, I'd like to read to you their company profile. Remember, in the background is a young boy in an orphanage, an impoverished family. Here's the company he now leads. Luxottica is a leader in the design, manufacture, and distribution of fashion, luxury, and sports eyewear. Its portfolio includes proprietary brands such as Ray-Ban, the glasses I'm wearing, Oakley, Vogue Eyewear, Persol, Oliver Peoples, Arnett, Costa del Mar, and Elaine Meekley, as well as licensed brands including Giorgio Armani, Burberry, Bulgari, Chanel, Coach, Dolce & Gabbana, Ferrari, Michael Kors, Prada, Ralph Lauren, Tiffany & Company, Valentino, and Versace. You might know a few of those names. Luxottica's international expansion has developed its geographic footprint worldwide. The group's global wholesale distribution network covers more than 150 countries across five continents and is complemented by an extensive retail network of approximately 9,200 stores. With lens crafters and Pearl Vision in North America, OPSM and Lobman Pank in Australia and New Zealand, Spectacle Hut in Singapore, GMO and Oticus Carol in Latin America, Salmaraji and Vigano in Italy, and Sunglass Hut worldwide. It is estimated today that little Leonardo Del Vecchio is worth $24.1 billion. We love those stories, don't we? Rags to riches tales of somebody who applied themselves, worked hard, and ended up as a great success. We love those stories of somebody who wore rags yesterday, who wears wool today, and who will wear cashmere and silk tomorrow. The story of the middle school student who was failing and yet who applied herself and in high school was the valedictorian. We love those rags to riches stories. They capture our imagination especially at Christmas time, when we go, if we can go these days, to the mall, and we see the elaborate, expensive displays 
the beautiful and rich Christmas trees, the candelabras, the lights, the music, the elegant wear that people are wearing. We're captivated by that. We dream rags to riches, especially at the holiday time. And yet that's curious. Because the curious thing about that is, if you go back to the first Christmas, the first Christmas was most assuredly not a tale of rags to riches. In fact, the first Christmas was a tale of riches to rags. Something that in this series, this Advent series this year, we're calling The Great Exchange. Today is our first four to follow of considering what exactly the great exchange included. I don't know that it's better stated than in the words of Ellen White taken from the book Desire of Ages. We'll come back to this quote more than once in this series. Listen to these words. Christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which, death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. The great exchange. We love the rags to riches stories, and yet the first Christmas story was a riches to rags story. It is told, maybe in the best possible way, in Paul's letter to the church at ancient Philippi. His letter to the Philippians chapter 2 contains the seminal passage of what we refer to as the Incarnation. There is no passage greater than this on the Incarnation in Scripture. Some scholars say it was a hymn to Christ. Well, we're going to consider only the first part of that hymn today, Philippians chapter 2, but I have to set a bit of the context. Because in the first short paragraph of Philippians 2, Paul is calling on his readers to unite, to be united in one mind and in one spirit. If Christ has done anything for you, he is saying, then draw together, be one in mind, one in heart, one in spirit, be united. Now, the obvious question is, how do we do that? In a world with so much division, so much polarity, in a world of division between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, how to do it? Well, Paul tells them how to do it. In a verse we're about to read, he will say, have the same mind, the same attitude that Jesus had. And then he goes on to describe the great exchange. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 5, says this, In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The great exchange. Whatever else that part of that song tells us, it tells us at least this. This is not a rags-to-riches story. It's a riches-to-rags story. This is not a story of upward mobility, but this is a story of deep descent on the part of God. So let's break that down, exactly what was included for him in this exchange. We begin with his highest. Let's look again, verse 6. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Very nature God. 
What does Paul mean by that? Could I summarize it this way? Jesus was God, fully God. Allow that to settle into your mind for a moment. Taking Paul at his word means that Jesus knelt in the primordial mud Soiling his hands with that mud, he formed out of the mud of the ground first the man and then the woman and breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. He was the source and the author of life, the creator of all that is. The psalmist would summarize it by saying, he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. He's the alpha, the omega too. But he was there at the beginning of it all. Very God. This is the one to whom many biblical personalities referred when they said, we cannot see God or we will die. This is the one whom the letter writer to the Hebrews would say, our God is a consuming fire. This is the one described by Paul to his young protege, Timothy, when he said he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one and only ruler, the one who alone has immortality. John the Revelator will refer to him with the words, who is, who was, who is to come, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the source of all that is life, the author and the finisher of our salvation, very God, that's Jesus. Who being in very nature God, his highest, and then began the descent. It began with this, you might say, Subtle, simple, but also serious step. Did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. The New American Standard Bible in its margin reading says, He did not assert his privilege of being God. If I could be so common, so profane as to suggest thinking about the Godhead, considering the reality of the plan to save a planet in redemption. Jesus did not at that confab say, as the other eyes turned on him, he did not say, well, you know, I am God. I have privileges. Did not. He laid those aside, did not assert his rights. Huh. Curious statement, isn't it? But the descent would continue and would pick up speed. There in verse 7, what did he get in exchange for that choice not to assert his own rights? He didn't get anything. Rather, verse 7 says, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. What did he get in exchange? He got nothing. In fact, verse 6 says, very nature God. Verse 7 says, very nature a servant. That's a profound step down. Now, that's not quite an accurate translation of what Paul says in verse 7 because the Greek word is doulos. The New Revised Standard Version translates it literally, very nature a slave. That's how he got nothing in response. From his highest God to our lowest slave. Except, wait a minute, that's not yet our lowest. There are two more steps down yet to take for Jesus. Verse 8, And being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. The sense of the verse is by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on 
across. Two further steps down. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the very point of death. That which the children of Adam and Eve would experience as the virus of sin flowed through our veins, he would subject himself to. He would follow the plan of God all the way to the point of the cross, obedient to the point of death. But even that is not our lowest. That comes in the last line, even death on a cross. He has descended from the heights to the depths. On a cross, we have lost much of the sense of that over the centuries of Christian history. But maybe the words of F.F. F. Bruce will help restore that to us. F.F. F. Bruce, that great University of Manchester New Testament scholar spoken of as the dean of evangelical scholars in the latter half of the 20th century, writes these words about this passage and about that reality of Jesus dying on a cross. These are F.F. F. Bruce's words. It was in the manner of Christ's death that the rock bottom of humiliation was reached. The words, death on a cross, have not been added to a composition already existing in order to adapt it more precisely to the historical facts. No, that's not it. The whole composition celebrates Jesus' humiliation, and his humiliation was crowned by his undergoing death on a cross. By the standards of the first century, no experience could be more loathsomely degrading than that. It is difficult for us after so many Christian centuries during which the cross has been venerated as a sacred symbol to realize the unspeakable horror and disgust that the mention or indeed the very thought of the cross provoked. By Jewish law, anyone who was crucified died under the curse of God. In polite Roman society, the word cross was an obscenity not to be uttered in conversation. Even when a man was being sentenced to death by crucifixion, an archaic formula was used that avoided the pronouncing of this four-letter word, as it was in Latin, crux. This utterly vile form of punishment was that which Jesus endured, and by enduring it, he turned that shameful instrument of torture into the object of his followers' proudest boast. May I never boast, said Paul, by contrast with other people's grounds of boasting, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, an incomprehensible turning upside down of all of the accepted values of his day by one who inherited both the Jewish and Roman attitudes to crucifixion. That was the cross. That's the reality of which Paul pins when he writes of God in the heights, very God, the glorious God of the galaxies with all the sublime, supreme, supernal, supernatural authority that were his prerogative. And yet who stepped down the starry stair steps of the sky, wrapped himself in human flesh, became obedient to the very point of death, and then the most vile, loathsome death of his day. Rags to riches? No, 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 no. The story of the first Christmas is a riches to rags story. We have domesticated it, cleaned it up, sanitized it. When Christmas comes around, the trees go up, the lights go on, the carols play, and the beautiful nativity scenes are on the hearth, proclaiming the gentle tenderness of a virgin mother and her child. We too easily neglect 
that casting its shadow across that sublime and tender scene is a cross in all its loathsome vulgarity. Philip Yancey captures this well, writing in the Jesus I Never Knew these words. When the Jesuit missionary Matteo Ricci went to China in the 16th century, he brought along samples of religious art to illustrate the Christian story for people who had never heard it. The Chinese readily adopted portraits of the Virgin Mary holding her child, but when he produced paintings of the crucifixion and tried to explain that the godchild had grown up only to be executed, the audience reacted with revulsion and horror. They much preferred the virgin, virgin and insisted on worshiping her rather than the crucified God. As I thumb, writes Yancey, through my stack of Christmas cards, I realize that we in Christian countries do much the same thing. We observe a mellow, domesticated holiday, purged of any hint of scandal. Above all, we purge from it any reminder of how the story that began in Bethlehem turned out at Calvary. We love rags-to-riches stories. But the story of the first Christmas is no rags-to-riches story. It's a story of riches-to-rags. But here is what's compelling about Christmas, about this season we call Advent. What is compelling is that it was driven by this reality called the Great Exchange. And in this passage, the Great Exchange says, He surrendered His highest and took our lowest. Why? Ultimately, that we might give up our lowest and claim His highest. Do you know what that means? That means that for Jesus, the first Christmas was a riches to rags story so that for you, this Christmas might be a rags-to-riches story. That's what he offers you. That's his great exchange, his highest for your lowest, so that you can give him your lowest and claim his highest. That's the great exchange. So how does it work? Well, it works something like this. June 19, 2016, the NBA Finals. The Cleveland Cavaliers have been down three games to one in this championship series. Almost no team can ever recover from a three games down to one standing in any series, any playoff series. But the Cleveland Cavaliers fight their way back into it until they tie it at 3-3. And on June 19, 2016, they actually claim the game and claim the crown 93-89. to After the game is over, Tyron Lue, the Cleveland Cavaliers head coach referring to Le LeBron James, that mega galactic NBA star who won the MVP for that series and on those final games was the difference maker. Tyron Lue, his coach, said simply this, great things happen to great people. Well, with all due respect to Coach Lue, that's not the gospel. Because the gospel says great things happen to bad people and spiritually poor people, spiritually wretched people, people who don't deserve anything, people who need nothing but condemnation, people who don't deserve anything at all. 
the gospel says great things happen to those people. It's the great exchange. The first Christmas for Jesus was a riches to rags tale so that this Christmas for you might be a rags to riches story. How does it work? Well, let me read you from the Mockingbird blog, the words of John Zoll. Listen to what Zoll writes. A few years ago, he writes, a friend who was the owner of a local high-end department store gave me a very generous gift certificate. When I went to use the gift certificate, he met me at the store and walked with me as I selected a sports coat, a dress shirt, and a pair of shoes. I made sure to look at each of the price tags on the sly so I could overshoot the gift certificate enough and put some cash back into the store's register, thereby showing my gratitude for his generosity. When I got to the register, I put my wallet on the counter and got out my credit card, but he placed the gift certificate in front of me and said, well, it looks like you've only spent a little more than half of your credit with us. I was shocked. In that moment, I realized he had only been charging me half the ticket price, which meant I was still in his debt. In a few weeks, I returned to the store with my wife, determined to show my appreciation by overspending the gift card. So this time, we approached the counter as a unified front with a huge armload of clothing and accessories. I handed our friend the gift certificate and got my wallet out. He took the gift certificate in hand and started entering the purchases into the register. Finally, when the bags were full, he turned to us and said, you're not going to believe this, but I've rung up everything, and the total comes to exactly zero. We started protesting. That can't be right. That total should be well above what was left of our store credit. Then he said, I don't think you understand how this gift certificate works. No matter what you throw at it, the total will always be zero. We finally understood his arrangement. In our attempt to buy ourselves out of his debt, we had completely missed the value of the gift, which this generous man took such pleasure in bestowing on us. Little Leonardo had nothing but fought his way to the top. A true rags to riches story. But you know what? The news I have for you this Christmas is far better than that. Do you need grace? Do you need righteousness? Do you need forgiveness? Do you need peace? Do you need joy? Do you need hope? It is available in abundant supply. Whatever might plague you as you live your life at your lowest can be taken by Jesus as he extends to you his highest free of charge. That's the message of Christmas. That's the great exchange of Philippians 2. The message is simple. For Jesus, the first Christmas was a tale of riches to rags so that for you, this Christmas might be a tale of rags to riches.